Hi everyone, my name is Glenda Diaz. I'm a family support worker at Parkdale High Park Early On Child and Family Center. Hi, my name is Christian Morgan. I'm also a family support worker at the same center. Hi everyone, my name is Dan Whitley and I work at the same center and I'm the office administrator. And for today, we're gonna to be talking with you all about temperament. Temperament describes the way we approach and react to the world. It is our own personal style that is, present, that is present from birth. There are three general types of temperaments often referred to as easygoing, slow to warm, and active. A person may fall into one of the three types of temperament, but often have varying behavior across the common temperament traits. Easygoing. An easygoing person is generally a happy, active person from birth and adjusts easily to new situations and environments. Slow to warm. A slow to warm person is generally observant, calm, and may need extra time in adjusting to new situations. Active. A person with an active temperament often has varied routines such as eating, sleeping, and often approaches life with zest. It is important to remember that temperament traits are a continuum. Some things are more on one side of the scale, others are, are the other way. Also, some of the qualities we see as not easygoing in babies or young children can be quite positive as they grow. There is no one temperament that is better than another it is important to know and recognize how we all experience the world. Common temperament traits. There are nine common traits that can help to describe a person's temperament and the way they react to and experience the world. We will take a look at nine and give behaviors for adults, children, and infants. It is important to recognize in ourselves that our temperaments are like in order to see the differences or similarities between us and our children in order to better support them in their experiences of the world. Thanks, Diane. So we'll start it off with the first trait. Um, this one is activity level. And as Diane explained, it is a continuum. And it's also sometimes very situational. So it depends on the situation. You might see some of these traits being either high or low on the continuum. So with the activity level, this is the general level of motor activity when you're awake or asleep. Motor activities involve large and small muscle movements like running, jumping, rolling over, holding a crayon, picking up toys. So one way to ask yourself whether you're high or low on this activity trait, on activity level trait, it's would you rather shoot hoops or would you rather lay in a hammock? So if your idea of a good pastime would be, I'd love to go do something active, then you are probably high on activity level. If you would rather lay in a hammock, you're probably low, but it can change throughout the day. Towards the end of the day, I would probably just wanna lay in a hammock. So with this one, you can ask about your child, does the infant always wiggle or squirm? Some babies are more active than others. Does a child have difficulty sitting still? We know that there are some kids that just wanna be on the go all the time. Is a child always on the go? And it, this is if they're high. If they're low, is the infant content to sit and quietly watch? Does a child prefer less movement and noise? Then when it comes to adults, does the adult have difficulty sitting still? They're high. And low is does the adult prefer to sit back quietly and prefer sedentary activities? And then highly active children may channel some extra energy into success in sports may perform well in high energy careers and may be able to keep up with many different responsibilities. So that's a highlight of somebody that has a high activity level. Nice. I was just thinking about myself not being able to sit still, <laughs> like for this very slide presentation. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're gonna look at the next uh, trait. It's a distractibility. This is one I can relate to. Um, <laughs> so to describe distractibility, the degree of concentration and paying attention displayed when one is not particularly interested in an activity. 
This trait refers to the ease with which external stimuli interfere with ongoing behavior. So you could ask yourself, how good are you at focusing? Are you more keen to zone out? That's me, anyway. Um, so if we're looking at the infant and child if, and at uh, the higher range of distractibility, these are some traits that we can see in an infant or a child. So is the infant easily distracted by sounds or sights while feeding? Or does the child become sidetracked easily when attempting to follow routine or working on an activity? And if we're looking at older in life, uh, the adult, does the adult have difficulty concentrating or paying attention when engaged in an activity and is easily distracted by sounds or sights? What's that? No. <laughs> so low, low, low level distractibility is seen in an infant and child like this. So is the infant easily soothed when upset by being offered an alternate activity? Can the child handle discomfort? Does not seem very bothered at all. So it's uh, very different, right? <laughs> and in the adult, does the adult have a high degree of concentration, pays attention when engaged in an activity, and is not easily distracted by sounds or sights? Just getting it done, you know? So high distractibility is seen as positive when it is easy to divert a child from an undesirable behavior but seen as a negative when it prevents the child from finishing schoolwork. <laughs> the next trait we're gonna look at is intensity. So this is the energy level of a response, whether positive or negative. So you can ask yourself, are you usually pretty measured or do you have an outsized reaction to negative or positive news? So in high intensity, does the infant react strongly and loudly to everything, even relatively minor events? Does a child show pleasure or upset strongly and dramatically? Which we know that sometimes we have children, especially toddlers, that go through phases of high, high intensity. The adult, does the adult have strong, intense, positive and negative reactions? And then the low level intensity is, does the child or infant react quietly when upset? And the adult, does adult have muted emotional reactions? So intense children are more likely to have their needs met and have many and may have depth of emotions usually not experienced by others. So their emotions, they feel very, very strongly and are very passionate about them. These children may be gifted in dramatic arts. And like you say, it's all on a continuum, right? Like, uh, yeah. not. <laughs> Not everyone's like fully intense all the time. <laughs> all right, another trait, we've got regularity. And this is not, I, I believe this is not to do with your bowel movements. Um, so we're looking at the predictability of biological functions such as eating and sleeping. Or I guess we are looking at bowel movements. <laughs> so you can ask yourself, is your routine stable or does it vary every day? So like, what what kind of day are you having? Is it pretty much the same or are you constantly changing it up every day? So a highly regular infant or child, does the infant or child get hungry or tired at predictable times? Like you could almost set a watch to when, oh yeah, he's gonna get sleepy in five, four, three, two. Um, and the adult, does the adult have predictable appetite or sleep, except all those kinds of different patterns in life? goes to sleep exactly at 9.30 every night. <laughs> I should be doing that, that's it. Um, so if it's a little more irregular, and in the infant we're looking at, is it, are they unpredictable in terms of hunger and tiredness? So it's lunchtime and they're not hungry, they're like, oh man, what's going on? <laughs> and then the adult, does the adult have unpredictable appetite, sleep, et cetera? So kind of the same thing, right? As grown-ups, irregular individuals may do better than others with traveling, as well as be likely to adapt to careers with unusual working hours. And so, yeah, we want to look at the, the positives of both ends, right? There's, there's a little good in everything. <laughs> so the next one we're going to look at is sensitivity. So this is how sensitive one is to physical stimuli. It's the amount of stimulation, sounds, taste, touch, 
temperature changes needed to produce a response. So you can ask yourself, how much do you react to external stimuli like bright lights or itchy clothing? So for me, for example, the bright lights wouldn't bother me so much, but there are certain materials that I just feel uncomfortable and I just can't wear them. And with children, this one, it's either they're high or low on this one. So it's, does a child or infant react positively, positively or negatively to particular sounds? Does the infant child or child startle easily to sounds? Is a child a picky eater or will they eat almost anything? Does the child respond positively or negatively to the feel of clothing? We do have a lot of kids that don't really like tags or don't really like certain materials. So it's good to know that about your child. And as adults, is the adult sensitive to physical stimuli, um, such as sounds, taste, touch, and temperature changes? Is a picky eater and has difficulty sleeping in a strange bed? So that's being highly sensitive. So being low sensitive is the adult not sensitive to physical stimuli and can fall asleep anywhere and tries new foods easily. And again, this one is such a continuum because it really depends on your schedule, your routine. Sometimes if something changes and you're extra tired, if we think of our children, if they are regularly in one routine and then we all of a sudden switch it up for them, you might see more sensitivity uh, within them. And then highly sensitive individuals are more likely to be artistic and creative. Hmm. Very well, that's, that's making me think of uh, at the center when people come in and, and maybe they've never met me before. <laughs> and I'll have a loud bark of a laugh. And you're and, very tall. <laughs> and I'm very tall. Some, some infants don't react well to this. <laughs> so, <laughs> and others are like, whatever, you're great. <laughs> Um, all right, now we're going to look at approachability. So this is one's initial response to new places, situations, or things. So you can ask yourself, do you love traveling and meeting new people? Or are you a bit of a homebody? So that's someone who likes to say, stay home. So someone who is more approachable, if we're looking at uh, on the high end of the scale, if we're looking at the infant and, ch and the child, does the infant or child eagerly approach new situations or people? And in an adult, you'd see, does, that, does the adult eagerly approach new situations or people? It's the same thing. <laughs> and then we have a more withdrawn um, individual. So does the infant or child seem hesitant and resistant when faced with new situations, people, or things? And it's the same with the adults. So it, you know, <laughs> the, this is something that can change over time for sure but some people are just like this for their whole lives right that one way or the other <laughs> so slow to warm up children tend to think before they act they are less likely to act impulsively during adolescence so that's a that's a giant positive <laughs> the next one we're going to look at is adaptability so how easily one adjusts to changes and transitions such as switching to a new activity. So you can ask yourself, how well do you handle change? And this one is especially important for toddlers, right? So taking that control in their life, you'll see that toddlers really, it depends on how they react in other temperament traits that can either help them be adaptable or not. And there are ways to be able to support children when they're either high or low on these traits. And we'll talk about that towards the end. So for this one, if you are high on adaptability, is the infant able to follow a new routine, a routine in a new environment? Um, does a child require a very small amount of time to feel okay in new situations? And for adults, is does the adult transition easily to new activities and situations? If you're low on adaptability, do the, does the infant or child have difficulty with changes in routines or transitions from one activity to another? So we know that some kids need a lot of transition time. Some kids are able to just jump to another activity and they're fine with it. Does a child take a long time to become comfortable to new situations? And for the adults, does the adult need more time for transition, for transitioning to new activities or situations? And a slow to adapt child is less likely to rush into dangerous situations and may be less influenced by peer pressure. Mm -hmm. 
Very nice. Ah, yes, persistence. <laughs> so this is the length of time a person continues in activities in the face of obstacles. So you can ask yourself, how long will you keep trying when things get hard? And uh, I find like persistence for me changes depending on like, if, if you have something you're interested in, you might be more persistent than otherwise, right? Obstacles easily throw you off if you don't care at all. <laughs> uh, so if we're looking at a highly persistent infant or child, um, or I guess both the high and low, does, does the child continue to work on a puzzle when he has difficulty with it, or do they just move on to another activity? Or is the child able to wait to have their needs met? And in the adults, someone who has a, is highly persistent, persistent, does the adult continue with a task or activity in the face of obstacles and does not get easily frustrated? And if they're lower down on the uh, persistence, does the adult move on to a new task or activity when faced with obstacles and gets frustrated easily? When a child persists in an activity and is asked to stop, they are labeled as stubborn. When a child stays with a tough puzzle, they are seen as being patient. The highly persistent child is more likely to succeed in reaching goals. A child with low persistence may develop strong social skills because they realize other people can help. This is, uh, yeah, it's good to see them on both ends of the spectrum, right? And it's sometimes, and this is where it gets hard sometimes, when your child is very persistent and you're like, I have a hard time getting them away from that activity, you know, just being able to switch your mindset and saying, yes, I'm having a difficult time getting them to transition. How can I help them to transition? But that persistence is amazing because it will help them as they get older. It's very similar to the distractibility. Yep. The next one we're gonna do is mood. So this one is your tendency to react to the world primarily in a positive or a negative way. So you can ask yourself, are you generally cheerful or a bit more serious? So I like this one when it's been the way that it's described as sometimes being a positive or being a sunrise person or being a serious or a more sunset person. Nothing wrong with being either or. So for the infant and the child being a sunrise person, does the child see the glass as half full? Do they focus on the positive aspects of life? is a child or infant generally in a happy mood and the adult does the adult react to the world in a positive way and is generally cheerful and then the more sunset person is the child that sees the glass half empty and tends to focus on the negative aspects of life and is the child generally more serious and in adults do they react in situations are they more observant and sometimes more serious or do they tend to be thoughtful about new situations? And serious children tend to be analytical and evaluate situations carefully. So there's nothing wrong with, you know, no, not everybody always has to have an instant smile on their face. And I know that sometimes, especially with young children, parents worry, my baby's so serious. But it's important to look at it from the aspect of they're just taking it all in and they're analyzing and they're looking and they're more cautious and that's okay. Mm -hmm. All right, so we got some points to remember. So first off, it is important to remind yourself that infants and toddlers, like adults, are unique individuals. Flexibility and creativity go a long way when supporting them. It might be helpful to think of yourself as a cook following a recipe. Just as a creative, flexible, and knowledgeable cook recognizes that there are key ingredients and principles of cooking that affect the outcome, there are key ingredients and principles that can help you manage when your child has a different personality than you, even if there is not one cookbook. <laughs> I like that in quotes, the cookbook. For handling differences in temperament. It can be really uh, confusing if someone's not just like you. <laughs> You're trying to parent them. <laughs> so it's important to avoid comparing and labeling. So it may be tempting to compare a child to yourself or others. You think, why can't you be more like so-and-so? But try to avoid these thoughts and certainly making comments like this to children. 
avoiding statements like I wish you were more outgoing or I wish you were less sensitive are really not helpful and risk making a child feel inadequate. So we always want to celebrate, um, even though it's hard, you know, you don't have to celebrate that they're not transitioning, but you can just give them the space or giving them the tools to transition from something to an, from some activity to another. It may be helpful to use words that say what you see and hear versus using a label like shy. Uh, these labels can stick. You can try, I see that you're having a hard time with, I see that you're having a hard time with leaving this puzzle. Let's talk about it or talk about what can be helpful to them. Ask them, what would help you? Would it be helpful for me to give you a five minute warning? Would it be helpful to give you three reminders or what can help you when we need to transition to something else? It's good to talk about these things. This so slow down and loosen the schedule. <laughs> so many of us are busy multitasking and rushing from one activity to the next. Children, even those with active temperaments, have not perfected that skill and require a bit more time to transition between activities than adults. Avoid having a schedule that is not flexible enough to accommodate children's needs and developing interests. Leave room in the day for unstructured time with a child. This is very important. You really want to have that chill, relaxed, <laughs> nothing hanging over you kind of time. And then remember the pluses. It's all too easy to focus on the challenges and difficulties of a child's temperament, particularly when it does not match your own. For every drawback, there is at least one major advantage. For example, slow to adapt children are less likely to be influenced by peer pressure Highly active kids are often at sports and do well, are often good at sports and do well in demanding jobs as adults, while serious children tend to be analytical and good evaluators. So look for and acknowledge children for their special traits and talents. Very nice. So aim for understanding and not change. So the goal is to better understand and then effectively support a child's temperament, not to change it. Temperaments make every child unique and remarkable in their own way. And then just quickly before we go, it's important that we are all born with our temperament. Like we can't change it. It's just the way that we see the world. We were born with it. It's just a matter of knowing how you react to the world and then knowing how your child reacts to the world so that then you can support them when there are things like transitions or schedules or routines that need to be followed. Mm -hmm. um, just quickly, we have some references. So this presentation was adapted from Center for Early Childhood Mental Health Consultation and the Roots of Empathy program. Thank you for joining us and we'll see you next time. Bye.